Meals on Wheels on the city's chopping block. A black bear that attacked a man has been put down. And charges laid after a local house fire. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The City of Thunder Bay could be getting out of another business in order to save money. Talks are now underway on the potential of handing over the Meals on Wheels program. The food service has been around since the late 1960s and it's the latest target in the city's core services review process. As Dennis Ward reports, the city has already found an organization with an interest in taking over Meals on Wheels. The core business review process previously put the Thunder Bay Conservatory and Municipal Golf Course under the microscope. Now the city-run Meals on Wheels program is being looked at. The local branch of the Canadian Red Cross has an interest in the support service and has had preliminary meetings with the city. Mayor Keith Hobbs has helped deliver the meals in the past and calls it a great program, but he does have some reservations about handing it over to another agency. That's something... I'd like to see us hang on to, but if we don't, um, Red Cross, I think, would be a great fit. My big concern, I brought it up at council, was if Red Cross got out of it, could it be sold to private, um, you know, or private to enterprise take it over? And uh, my main concern is that those seniors and those people that need those meals are going to get nourishment and uh, they can depend on their meals, and that's what the program's all about. The Red Cross already operates meals on wheels in other communities. District Manager Rob Kilgore says it fits in with other services provided in Thunder Bay to help seniors in their homes. The Red Cross is currently developing a proposal. The mayor believes the idea needs to be studied further. Obviously there's implications with union as well, so, uh, and jobs. Um, so uh, we want to protect jobs and we also want to protect seniors and protecting the seniors is the number one issue. The talks so far have been held completely behind closed doors. Those who helped create the local Meals on Wheels program and those who administer it today were caught off guard when asked about the possible changes. Transferring the program to the Red Cross would save the city roughly $100,000 a year. Dennis Ward, TBT News. The bear that attacked a man twice and killed a dog at Sandbar Lake Provincial Park near Ignace has been put down. MNR spokesperson Yolanta Kowalski says it's rare to see a bear demonstrate this kind of predatory behavior. The incident occurred Saturday when a 42-year-old Thunder Bay man was hiking the trails with his two dogs when the bear attacked them from behind. He ran into the lake and the bear walked away. But when the man attempted to walk back to his campsite, the bear attacked again and one of the two dogs was killed. The man was taken to hospital in Dryden with minor injuries and released. The black bear was located and shot the next day but ran away. Kowalski says it was then caught in a live trap on Monday and was taken to a vet to be euthanized because it posed a threat to public safety. The park trails around Sandbar Lake Provincial Park remain closed as the investigation into the incident continues. Three young men are now in custody following a police pursuit east of Marathon over the weekend. One of the men was arrested and two others fled after a vehicle was stopped yesterday afternoon. OPP closed the highway for almost an hour while they searched the area. The remaining suspects were caught early this morning. A quantity of cocaine was found in the car. The three men, aged 20, 22 and 23 from Kitchener, Ontario, are now facing a variety of charges. Meanwhile, Marathon OPP have provided an update on a body that was found in a vehicle by a group of blueberry pickers on Saturday. Police believe the body is that of a Waterloo, Ontario man who went missing in June. OPP say they do not suspect any foul play, but a postmortem is being carried out. Thunder Bay OPP responded to a three-vehicle collision at the corner of Highway 1117 and Balsam Street today. Just after 11 o'clock this morning, the driver of an SUV was traveling eastbound on the highway, approaching the Balsam Street intersection. OPP say the driver was behind a vehicle, and when the traffic signal turned to green, the driver changed lanes and collided with an oncoming eastbound tractor-trailer unit. A second eastbound transport struck an initial tractor trailer from behind. Transport had one occupant. Uh, he was assessed and uh, did not have any injuries. The uh, passenger SUV had two, uh, two uh, passengers. Uh, they were also assessed and did not have any injuries and refused to go to the hospital with us at this time. 
The 27-year-old female driver of the SUV from Calgary has been charged with not safely changing lanes. The owner of a home that broke into flames on Mount Dill Avenue on Saturday night has now received a fine. There were no working smoke alarms inside the residence at the time the blaze began. The Ontario Fire Marshal has taken over the investigation and there's still no word on the cause. Fire crews were called at around 10 o'clock Saturday night. Upon arrival, crews discovered huge flames at the rear of the single-story home. The fire was contained primarily to the first floor, but there is extensive damage throughout the house from heat and smoke. Fire Prevention Officer Eric Nordland says the fire was discovered by sheer luck. The five tenants in the home escaped uninjured, but two occupants were stuck in the building and had to be rescued out of a basement window. The owner of the home has now been charged for failing to install a working smoke alarm. The cost of the ticket is $235 for each alarm. Whoever has care and control of that property, um, if, you're a, if you're a homeowner that rents it out, you need to demonstrate that you're checking those smoke alarms on a regular basis. You've got a responsibility to make sure that they're installed, that they work, and that any building occupants, that the tenants, have the information on how to operate those smoke alarms. Nordland says smoke alarms are the only thing that give you sufficient notice of a fire. Thunder Bay Fire and Rescue currently have their summer smoke alarm program running to remind residents of the importance of having working smoke alarms in your house. The Chief of Police for the Treaty 3 Police Service has resigned. Conrad de la Ronde will serve the final three months of his contract until November. The resignation letter states that the past several months have been extremely difficult on de la Ronde, but he will continue to provide the best possible service until his employment ends. There recently were concerns the police service would be disbanded because of funding problems and disputes with the union representing the Treaty 3 officers. But a new board has pledged to address those issues and keep it operating. Port stats are in for the month of July and it continues to be a slower than average summer for Thunder Bay. Shimmins are down 20 to 40 percent across the board compared to this time last year. But it might not be all bad news. The dip seems to be caused in part by the loss of the Canadian wheat board. In July of 2012, there was over 600,000 tons of grain shipped, but this July saw just 360,000 tons. The total for July saw less than 500,000 tons of cargo come through the port, compared to over 820,000 tons a year ago. Because the port closes for the winter, much of the traffic happens in spring and fall. Port Authority CEO Tim Heaney says when the numbers are examined on a crop year basis as opposed to a calendar year basis, Thunder Bay is down only 2% in shipments. That's, you know, not a radical decline, but we are watching things closely. There's about 2 million more tons of grain, we're told, has gone directly into the U.S. post wheat board. And there's also uh, wheat destined for Europe going off the West Coast. So we know we're losing a little bit to that, and we're, we're watching that very closely. The Port Authority is optimistic, though. Big shipments are expected to start rolling in within the next two weeks as the fall harvest begins. Use of the new crane has also been down this year, but with large shipments coming and the oil sands moving along, the crane is expected to be used much more at the end of this season and into next year. The owner of a Thunder Bay landmark has been ordered to fix the place up or demolish the building immediately. The Lyceum Theatre opened its doors more than 100 years ago and was used for stage productions before being converted into a movie theatre. But after sitting empty for years, the building is in rough shape. The city's building inspector has recently declared the Lyceum structurally unsafe and has issued a number of orders. The roof has been breached with water and birds and they've gained entry. The order says the current conditions could be hazardous to health or safety. The city has called for the owner to immediately make the site safe by demolishing the building and secure the area following the demolition. Contacting the owner has been difficult, but Mayor Keith Hobbs says he has major concerns about the building. Trying to get to uh, property owners when you have a numbered company, it's sometimes hard when they just walk away. Um, and we have our timelines for back taxes and you know, we have to wait a certain period before we can claim that building back for back taxes. Um, so right now that is under the uh, gun right now. We're looking at that building right now. The mayor has been speaking out about derelict buildings since the back wall of the Empire Hotel collapsed in June. He wants to look at doing an audit of older buildings in rough shape but knows that would be costly. A newly formed partnership between Confederation College and Northern College is bringing an abundance of mining programs to Thunder Bay. Students enrolled in the Mining Techniques Certificate Program will now have the option to gain a diploma. 
The new program to be launched this fall will give students the opportunity to take an additional semester. Mining is on the upswing in the region and Confederation College wants to offer training closer to home. With the geographical challenges that are often faced in the Northwest, the college thinks this is the perfect time to launch the pilot project. We, we do the first year ourselves here. The second year will be done here but delivered by Northern College. Okay. So we use a combination of, of people here to facilitate delivery but also technology, video conferencing, online types of delivery. Matter says the arrangement between the two schools stemmed from a memorandum of understanding that was recently signed by six colleges in Northern Ontario. Well, an old school bus in, Thunder Bay, in the Thunder Bay area is getting a radical makeover to transform into a mobile classroom. The newly dubbed Eco Bus will soon be delivering educational opportunities with its innovative, eco-savvy technology. Nate Jones has more. For local teacher Catherine Leonard, it's a dream that has been in the works for years. Thanks to a grant from the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and a loan from the Canadian Young Business Foundation, it's now coming true. She and her husband are one month into the transformation of the bus, and there's a lot to be done. Leonard says she saw a gap in the education system and wanted to be able to deliver science-based programs to remote communities. Access to busing is difficult for teachers to secure, and then the cost of field trips and busing is uh, also a barrier. So my idea for this um, turned turned into the EcoBus. After a fresh coat of paint, there will be many environmentally friendly features added. Besides running on used vegetable oil from local restaurants, the bus will have solar panels and a mini wind turbine to run the electrical system. The inside will contain an onboard lab and teaching space to work out of. Upgrades to the bus are expected to top out at about $36,000. Leonard says that the EcoBus will help to facilitate what she calls on-site field trips. A lot of the goals of the programs are to get students outside um, and uh, to help show teachers how to get students outside more um, and give them tools so that uh, once the EcoBus is gone, they can continue to do that. Leonard plans to start off with a curriculum for grades 4 to 8, and next year she'll be integrating grades 9 to 12. The EcoBus is expected to roll out in October of this year. Nate Jones, TBT News. The owner of Gallery 33 is hoping to set a world record when it comes to the brand new flooring in her shop. It's taken 210,000 pennies so far, but Hannah Johnson still needs approximately 45 to 50,000 more pennies to finish the project. She's been collecting the discontinued coins since January. With the help of over 20 volunteers and a total of 40 hours of work, around three quarters of her gallery has been completed. If she covers the entire floor, she will have set a new world record, but says she's faced a number of challenges. The hardest part was collecting the pennies because that took a few months. But the hardest part so far has been installing them. It, it's really, um, it's a lot more labor intensive than I think I originally anticipated. And that's why I was really surprised that people were putting in like 15 plus hour days helping me out. Johnson is encouraging the public to come donate their leftover pennies and have the chance to lay one on the floor. The gallery is located at 33 South Cumberland Street. She hopes to have the project complete by the end of the month. That is a lot of pennies. I just got a brainwave. What? I wouldn't mind constructing a floor of two knees. But I need That'd be very costly I need floor. people to volunteer their two Oh, I see. You just there want you go. people's two knees. <laughs> be a, be a, a good night to make a floor anyway, wouldn't it? True. Yeah. Uh, Border Cats, uh, Sarah, they have been rained out. It's a wet start to the work week once again. And I doubt very much that the Canadian Little League game will be played unless that rain stops. Well, that, uh, that one's still to be called, I guess, but uh, the Border Cats game definitely uh, put off for tonight due to that rain. I know uh, Holly probably told you last night it was definitely going to be umbrella weather. You can see the last 24 hours bringing that precipitation into our area of the region. Today we did get up to 20 degrees, although it was short-lived, probably from only about 4 o'clock this afternoon to maybe 20 after 4. Rain showers throughout most of the day. In total, we got about five millimeters of rain in those winds, up to about 19 kilometers per hour. Currently in the region, it's drying out a little bit. Those temperatures, mid to high teens in most of the areas, except a bit cooler in Big Trout Lake, where they're at 13, and down in Marathon at 22 degrees. 
Currently in Sault Ste. Marie, they're sitting at 22 degrees under partly cloudy skies. Thunder Bay tonight, our low is expected to drop down to 12 degrees, and those thunder showers and showers are expected to pick back up again, bringing with them about 5 millimeters of rain. Wind switching from the northwest, gusting up to about 22 kilometers per hour. As we get into tomorrow, we can see this cool front heading our way will continue to bring that precipitation and likely thunderstorm activity into tomorrow. Some pop-up showers. Later on in the week, we can see that cool front and jet stream still hover over our area of the country. However, I will have more on that later on in the newscast. Thanks, Sarah. Well, two young boys are said to have been killed by a python in New Brunswick yesterday. We have that story for you coming up as your Tuesday News Hour continues. Right now, we, we have an expert from the, the mountain zoo that is uh, helping us to deal with the other animals that are still in the store. Um, so at that point, uh, we don't know if they're going to be removed from that store. Everyone is looking for answers about the deaths of two young boys reportedly killed by a python in Campbellton. Noah and Connor Bart were staying over at their best friend's apartment above a reptile store when it happened yesterday. As Mark Genuis reports from Campbellton, the community is in disbelief and a family is devastated. 
People have left teddy bears to show their sympathy for the two boys. Four and a half and six-year-old Noah and Connor Bart were smothered by an African rock python on Monday. Almost too strange to be true for many in Campbellton. It's incredible. It's impossible. You see it just like in the films. It's the habit. It's in the films. Now it's. It's the same reaction at the grocery store. I thought it was horrible. You can't keep uh, animals like that in a house. Police say the snake was kept in the apartment above the store. The, the cage uh, was up to the ceiling and uh, just above the, uh, the cage, a small vent was there for the, uh, connected with the uh, ventilation system. Their investigation continues with the help of an expert from the Magnetic Hill Zoo in Moncton. They must decide whether to seize other animals. Right now we, we have an expert from uh, the Moncton Zoo that is uh, helping us to deal with the other animals that are still in the store. Um, so at that point, uh, we don't know if they're going to be removed from that store. The family says the boys spent their last day with the owner. Their last day was spent playing with their friends in the backyard, had a little pool, had a barbecue. And later in the afternoon, Jean-Claude Savoy uh, took all the children shopping the family says they now want to be left alone as they grieve. Mark Genuist, CBC News, Campbellton. An inquest is underway into the shocking case of a homeless Aboriginal man who died after 34 hours waiting for treatment at a Winnipeg hospital ER. Here's Cameron McIntosh with more. Well, really, the facts of what happened to Brian Sinclair are pretty clear and have been for a while now. Brian Sinclair, in September 2008, went into a Winnipeg emergency room complaining of abdominal pain that was later uh, found to be related to a catheter that he was using. He checked in with a triage nurse. That triage nurse took some notes. He then waited 34 hours, got no care, and died in that emergency room. What the point of this is, is to determine why. What happened? What failed? How did he fall through the cracks? The Winnipeg Regional uh, Hospital's uh, Health Authority has already said that this is a systematic failure. It, uh, in previous uh, occurrences, has uh, apologized to the Sinclair family. It did so again today in court saying it wants to get some answers here as well, pointing out that it's already made some changes to the hospital system here since this incident occurred, including changing triage procedures, taking away paper notes, putting in an electronic system and a double check system. But Real questions are being asked here about the system itself. And one, uh, one question that's already been posed here in the opening statements was Brian Sinclair's status as a disabled Aboriginal person, did it have anything to do with the fact that he was basically ignored? One question that's already been posed here and one question that will be posed over the next several months as this uh, inquest gets underway. It will hear from more than 70 witnesses. Now, important to note that the... Uh, inquest itself here is not designed and is not tasked with finding individual blame. It's tasked with finding problems within the system and its recommendations won't necessarily be, bi be binding, although the Winnipeg Regional Hos Health Authority has said that it will take them very seriously. The U.S. airlifted embassy staff out of Yemen today because of the recent terrorist threat. And Yemen claims American drones attacked an alleged al-Qaeda target that is not confirmed. Carolyn Dunn has more on the security alert. Under threat, the U.S. Embassy in Yemen remains closed again today. U.S. citizens warned early this morning to get out of the country. Up to 100 non-essential embassy staff and even some emergency staff were flown out of Yemen by military plane to Germany. Our focus is on keeping uh, both our personnel and citizens who are uh, traveling overseas safe. Yemen is one of 19 embassies the U.S. has shuttered in a dramatic, wide-scale reaction to a truly remarkable bit of intelligence. Reports say the U.S. intercepted communications between al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahri and his deputy, the leader of Yemen's al-Qaeda branch, Nasser al wuhaishi The message, do something big. Al-Qaeda in Yemen has been particularly brash in its attempts to attack the U.S. Most recently, it was behind that underwear bombing attempt on a 2009 Christmas Day flight to Detroit, as well as trying to send an explosive printer cartridge to Chicago. They have people who are very determined and very patient in attempting to carry out these attacks against the United States. But Yemen is insulted by the decision of the U.S. and the U.K. to evacuate staff. It says that only serves the interests of the extremists. 
and undermines the cooperation between Yemen and the international community. This was a decision uh, related to a specific uh, immediate threat. Uh, that's why we made the decision, but it doesn't have an impact. Uh, or we don't see it having an impact on our larger relationship with the government. Those relations are critical now when what is being termed the most serious terror threat against the U.S. since 9-11 has been identified but not neutralized. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. It's estimated up to 15 percent of Canadian women who have given birth have experienced postpartum depression. No one knows for sure what the trigger is, but a new study is shedding some light on one potential factor. As Michelle Chung reports, for new moms, bigger cities may mean a bigger risk. Oh, here's one where they're all really little. <laughs> Andrea Page can laugh now, but back then she says she was suicidal. I was working crazy hours and Moses was colicky. So he would cry from 8 o'clock at night till 2 in the morning, chronically. For three months, I probably cried and had an emotional breakdown every single day. She had moved to Toronto from Edmonton at that time, and unlike the smaller city, she didn't have anyone to lean on. Most of the women that I meet in Toronto are spread as thin as saran wrap. They, they feel they don't have the time or energy to help somebody else. A new report in the Canadian Medical Association Journal published today says women living in large Canadian cities are at a higher risk of suffering from postpartum depression. 10% of those new mothers suffered from postpartum depression compared to 6% of women who live in rural communities. Women living in these large urban areas reported uh, much lower levels of social support and social support is a very big risk factor. Dr. Simone Vigod is one of the authors of the report. She says researchers also found immigrant women were at risk. Right. Have they moved away from their families of origin so they don't have the same level of support? Vigod says that if we want to see lower rates of postpartum depression in cities, then we need to find different ways to provide social support for new mothers. Would it be helpful for her to have a group of other moms to talk to? Yeah, we could help with that. Would it actually be helpful for her to have respite so somebody could come and give her a nap? We don't have that as much. As for Paige, she moved out of the big city and has found the support she needs. At the end of the day, it's like you've got to make sure that you're healthy and that you're there for your kids. And Michelle Chung, CBC News, Toronto. We'll move over big box. Many retailers are starting to think more compactly. Some major players, including Walmart, Best Buy, and Canadian Tire, are moving toward more boutique locations in urban areas. As Aaron Salzman reports, retailers are hoping that downtown consumers will buy into a faster, more convenient shopping experience. When Ian Reeks needed a new barbecue, he headed for the newest store in his neighborhood on his bicycle. As, as long as it's close and it's not up a hill, then I like it. It's on flat ground, it's certainly close, and Reeks found a grill small enough to carry home in a backpack. He is exactly the type of customer this new Canadian tire store hopes to attract. The notion of opening an express store, particularly in an urban market, was all around getting closer to our urban customer. This is the first of what Canadian Tire says will be many express stores across Canada. About one-fifth the size of a standard Canadian Tire, it's in an older residential neighbourhood right on the subway line, and the inventory is tailored to the community. They also have older homes here in this neighbourhood. They're 100 plus years old. So we said, you know what, when we build the store, we're going to make sure we have a full complement of light-duty home repair goods for those customers. Customers. It's all part of a bigger trend that has big box stores going smaller. It's one of the reasons why Loblaw wanted to buy Shoppers Drug Mart and its network of smaller urban stores. Even the biggest big box of them all, Walmart, is starting to incorporate the boutique business model. It's very important to be smaller, closer and connected to local neighborhoods, each of which is a little bit different. And so if you can supply the unique needs of an individual neighborhood, then you're going to need a smaller store to do that. Going smaller may also be a way to avoid the protests that can accompany big box stores trying to move into established neighborhoods. People who live near the new Canadian Tire Express have mixed feelings about their new neighbor. Instead of driving, you know, um, it's, it's convenient for, for, for the neighborhood. I was a little concerned because it's going to compete with the hardware store up the road and I would hate to see that go out. I make some jerk chicken. <laughs> Ian Reeks says he'll be back. Why not if it's here, right? 
It's here, and it may soon have some company. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Let's take a look at the day's markets. In Toronto, the TSX plunged 133 points to 12,469. The Dow lost 93 points to 15,518. And the Nasdaq fell 27 points to 3665. The Canadian dollar closed at 96.38 cents US, up 13 one hundredths. Gold fell $19.90 to $1,200 per ounce. And crude slipped $1.26 to $105 per barrel. Well, today wasn't the best day for golfing, but uh, we did have pretty good weather for the golf tournament, which is one of the oldest in the city. Yeah, weekend. I guess Mother Nature was smiling on the folks at the Strathcona mm -hmm. Invitational, and it being the oldest golf tournament, I'm glad things worked out yeah. well for them. Well, the second major in local golf would wrap up on the Civic Holiday. Randy Robinson took home this year's Senior Championship. Well, the Super Senior title went to Jack Palmer in the championship flight, a first time winner was going to be crowned. At the Strath, after beating two-time defending champ Robert Cumming on Sunday, Jamie DePiro went up against Jordan Gale, and things were all square after the front nine on 11. After getting stuck behind a tree, DePiro misses the par putt. He would concede the hole. Gale goes one up, but DePiro would make up for that miss on the next hole. Watch him drain the eight-foot birdie putt here. That will get the match back to all square. A decent following on hand to watch the final match. Of course, it wasn't raining. To 13, Gale's turn to get hot with the flat stick. He'll read the putt perfectly with great speed. He'll roll it in, he'll win the hole and restore his one-up lead. Let's uh, skip ahead now to the 15th. The Piro with a chance for birdie, but he races it by. That left the door wide open for Gale, and he'll drain the bird no problem. That pushes his lead to two up. 
On the par 5 16th, after missing the green with his second shot, Gale chips from off the putting surface and he almost drains it. A great shot to get himself a birdie. DePiro got to the green in two. He is a lengthy eagle putt to win the hole. He reads it right, but it will come up just short. So DePiro would tap in for Bird and things were squared heading to 17 after another chip from off the green. Gale has a putt for par to win the tournament. And it drops. Jordan Gale is this year's Strathcona Invitational Champ in his eight years of playing in it. It's the first time he's won the event, and he's pretty excited to be joining past champs like Barry Kalin and Robert Kelly. Sentences all those great players. Uh, they've owned this tournament for decades, and you know, first win. But I'm just glad that uh, my name's going to be up on that wall. My name's going to be on that trophy. So this weekend went awesome. I'm really happy with the way I played. Um, would have been nice to get the win, but uh, unfortunately, you, you know, you win some, you lose some. But in the long run, I could build off this and hopefully come back next year and take it down. So, And the final major of the golf season, the district amateur, is set for Labor Day weekend. Well, first place uh, will be on the line tonight at Baseball Central as the host of Thunder Bay selects King Clinchenworth in tomorrow night's one versus four semifinal. If they can beat Cape Breton, who have given up only 10 runs in five games. At last report, we have not received official word on that game being canceled. But the Border Cats, Ryan Atwood, he'll have to wait almost another 24 hours for his first win of the season because tonight's game with Eau Claire at Port Arthur Stadium, set for a 7.05 start, has been rained out. The team will play two seven-inning games starting at 5.05 tomorrow. Meantime, the Cats proved to be no match for Rochester at Subway Field last night. Mike Albanese recaps. The Thunder Bay Border Cats hosted the Rochester Honkers in the second half of this two-game homestand, looking to split the series 1-1. Top of the third, after a quiet start, a wild pitch sets up Parker Sullivan to move to third to be brought home by Caleb Dugas on the same up to bat. Now top of the sixth, things get a little louder as Tyler Baker scores a run off of Matt Halloran's ground ball outright to bring the game to 2-0. Two, to two batters later, Jared Deacon blasts the ball out center field, bringing home Halloran to score a run. Next batter, things still rolling for the Honkers as Deacon is brought home to score a run from Sullivan's grounder. Next play, Kalei Hanawahin grounds a ball which is then misplayed allowing Sullivan to score. The Honkers went on to score three more runs to end the inning, 8-0. Next inning, the Honkers still on fire as Hanawahin finds himself up to the plate with bases loaded and he knocks one up center field, bringing in Mike Friel, Deacon, and Sullivan. Thunder Bay's luck never ended up finding them as a wild pitch brought home Hanawahin. Rochester scored their final run of the inning when Baker grounded one out left to allow Dugas to score. Thunder Bay was held hitless until the bottom of the seventh as Rochester hung on to win 14-1. Mike Albanese, TBT Sports. Josh Johnson heads to the hill tonight as the Blue Jays resume their 10-game road trip in Seattle. Let's check out the series opener last night at Safeco. Jay starter R.A. Dickey gets laid up in the seventh. Justin smoke, smokes a pitch for his 11th round tripper. That opens his scoring and it's one zip. Top of eight, Brett Laurie will punch one into the gap. Watch him fly around the bases as he stretches it into a triple. Jose Reyes then brings the Canadian home with... An RBI single. Still on the eighth, the Jays three of the nest. Oliver Perez frustrated. He'll give up the single to Mark DeRosa. And two Jays cash in. It's 3-1 Toronto. And hey, look at all the Jays fans in Seattle. Casey Jansen closes out a strong outing by Dickey. He'll get his 20th save of the season as the Bluebirds win it 3-1. to one. Uh, We were going to wait for the guy to toss it over to first to get the... Uh, but it was an out. You have to take my word for it. A dozen Major League players were handed 50-game suspensions on Monday following the biogenesis investigation. Yankees infielder Alex Rodriguez received the harshest penalty. He's been suspended the rest of this year and all of next season, but will appeal. We get the details in this report. After weeks of trying to work out a deal with Major League Baseball, it's a league that refused to play ball with Alex Rodriguez, suspending the Yankee slugger for 211 games, the remainder of the 2013 and the entire 2014 season. Realizing a punishment was on the way, A-Rod sat down with reporters on Saturday, saying he plans to be a role model at home. I plan to sit my girls down with Cynthia, and we're going to have a, a lengthy conversation. Um, and I'll have an opportunity to tell, tell it all. I, I, at some point.
In January, A-Rod was linked with 12 other players into the now-closed Biogenesis Clinic, which allegedly provided players with performance-enhancing drugs, such as human growth hormone. Of the 12 players accepting the 50-game suspensions handed out by the league, All-Stars Nelson Cruz of the Rangers, Johnny Peralta of the Detroit Tigers. The Blue Jays' Melky Cabrera served his time last year. Ty Crawford, who works with the Maple Leafs inter-county team, claims PEDs are making players stronger and have changed the game in a bad way. When you ask me what has it done for the game, it, it's increased the game. It's enhanced the game. It's made it, made it stronger, better, whatever. But what has it done for the children? What has it done for the kids out here? It's all told them that you, in order to make it to the big leagues, you have to be a cheater. A-Rod is poised to receive the costly suspension levied in baseball. It could exceed $35 million, and there's a reason. Baseball would defend itself and say that it's because he's done more than just use, uh, but reportedly used, obstructed, lied, recruited, and for all those different reasons, he's subject to something bigger. He'll be allowed to play while he appeals. He's earned over $350 million in his career and has $86 million left on his contract and sits just 13 home runs shy of passing Willie Mays all time. He just finished rehab in the minors and his legacy is tarnished. This was a surefire first ballot Hall of Fame player who would have gone down in the discussion as one of the greatest players to ever pick up a bat and a glove. Instead, he'll be picking up the pieces. With a bad hip and at 38 years old, it may be over. If he returns at 40, he'll still earn $60 million. Rob Malcolm, Global News. Well, the Phoenix Coyotes held a news conference this afternoon to formally announce that ICE Arizona are the team's new owners. Thunder Bay's Anthony LeBlanc is part of that group. Week 6 in the CFL opened last night in BC. Pick it up, second quarter, 9-3 Winnipeg. Lions quarterback Travis Lule fakes the end around. He'll find Sean Gore in the end zone. That's a 20-yard strike, 10-9 Leos. Later in the quarter, after Justin Goltz is picked up, uh, He'll give the home team some good field position. Lule threads the needle to Corey Williams. That made a 17-9 for the BC Lions. Pretty nice catch there. But Goltz and the bomb squad will strike late in the first half. Enough of the uh, celebrating there, guys. Let's move on here. Out the play action, Goltz calls his own number. He'll scamper five yards for the touchdown. We got a game. Winnipeg trails by a point. Let's head now to the fourth. Now 19-17. Lule sets up the pass again. He will get, get it to Courtney Taylor at the goal line. He'll cross the plate. It's an 11-yard touchdown. BC goes on to win it 27-20. to 20. So the Bombers fall to, what are they now, 1-5, and five, Holly? Something like that. Yeah, pretty safe to say. They but they're entering their bye week, so you know maybe things will work out for them. Here's hoping something happens. Still okay. time to turn it around. Favor. Yes. Sure. Well, some uh, murder mystery highlighting tonight's television lineup. With more, here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8, it's NCIS. And the team works with the FBI after someone tries to kill Agent Fornell. Then on NCIS Los Angeles, a communal water jug is contaminated with cyanide poison. And at 10 on Haven, Audrey's murder investigation uncovers a series of supernatural phenomena. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 7.30, grab a cuppa with the gang from Coronation Street. Then at 8, Rick gets a new perspective at a small car rollover competition on The Rick Mercer Report. At 8.30 on 22 Minutes, we've got a Storage Wars unit stuffed with Canadian content. And at 9, a dying man tells Deb and Cece the location of a valuable gold claim on Arctic Air. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists.
Well, we saw a rainy start to the shortened work week, Sarah. Is this something we can see continuing for the rest of the work week? Well, at least for tonight and uh, a little bit into tomorrow, hopefully by the end of the week, some of that sunshine will start to uh, show up again, much like you would expect in August. Today we did get up to 20 degrees, but it was short-lived. Only about 20 minutes we were at 20 degrees. Rain showers for most of the day brought with it about 5 millimeters, and those winds coming from the north-northeast. Across the country today, uh, British Columbia, quite seasonal. We do have some thunderstorm watches in some northeastern parts of British Columbia. Thunderstorm watches in uh, southwestern portion of Alberta. Calgary, not included in that, but currently sitting at about 20 degrees. Regina right now, as we uh, look into the prairies, cooler than normal. They're currently sitting at 16 degrees and some thunderstorm activity, 21 degrees in Saskatoon. Winnipeg is sitting at 20 degrees and a few wind gusts uh, throughout the day today. That's expected to die down a bit later into tonight. As we uh, look into southern Ontario, in Toronto, 22 degrees, but that Humidex has it feeling much closer to about 30, which is typical for this time of year. Ottawa, Montreal, pleasant and seasonal temperatures, about 25 degrees today. Quebec City is also sitting at 25 degrees. So we move on to the East Coast in Halifax. Also windy today, 22 degrees, currently what they're sitting at. Those winds are expected to die down overnight. Fredericton sitting at 22 degrees and 21 in Charlottetown. St. John's currently at 17 degrees, and those winds are gusting right now, currently up to about 50 kilometers per hour, which is quite windy. In our region today, we can see this cool front moving over us, bringing with it into tomorrow that precipitation that I have been talking about. A little bit later on in the week, uh, we can see that that precipitation will continue into Thursday. However, it does start to move out, which is some good news. Overnight tonight across the region, those temperatures dropping down to about 8 degrees in most areas. A bit cooler, 7 degrees in Sioux Lookout, 9 in Armstrong, 5 up in Big Trout Lake, and some thunderstorm activity in Sault Ste. Marie at 16 degrees, expected overnight. Tomorrow, still a bit cool for this time of year. Those temperatures mid to high teens, and some pop-up rainstorm activity uh, in the Greenstone area. Then right at this hour, that temperature has dropped down to about 16 degrees under cloudy skies. We still have some showers in certain areas of the city, so some people, if you look out your window, may still be experiencing that. Those winds have shifted to the north-northeast, gusting up to about 19 kilometers per hour. Overnight tonight in Thunder Bay, our low is expected to drop down to about 12 degrees. Shower or chance of a thunderstorm, most likely a shower, bringing with it another 5 millimeters of rain overnight tonight. And those winds coming from the northwest gusting up to about 12 kilometers per hour. To start your day off tomorrow, cloudy in the morning, but those passing showers are expected to make a reappearance around lunchtime. 18 degrees by 4 o'clock we should have sun and cloud the sun peeking out a little bit and getting up to about 20 degrees which was our high for today for the rest of the week uh, i already talked a little bit about wednesday so we'll get into thursday some thunderstorms possibly later on in the day and a high of 18 degrees dropping down to about 8 overnight on thursday Friday, mix of sun and cloud and 21 degrees expected. Great start to the weekend. That's expected to continue on Saturday and into Sunday with mostly sunny. Hopefully that sticks around and that's your weather forecast. Society Shelter. Tonight, Fiona Gardner introduces us to Sam, a 10-month-old Collie Cross. Uh, 
Hi, this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is a gorgeous 10-month-old Collie Cross named Sam. And Sam was surrendered to the Humane Society by his owner. He was a little much to handle. As a Collie and as a big dog, he's looking for a home where people have lots of energy and time to work with him. He's actually quite smart and really willing to learn, but he needs some time and attention to uh, be put through the paces. He's fine with kids. He's actually, despite his size, very gentle and uh, seems to be okay with most other dogs. So if you've got the time and uh, the love for a big boy like this, come meet Sam today. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet. Expert advice and high quality pet food within your budget. Well, if you don't like trimming your hedges, you want to stick around for this next story coming up after the break. It's a good one. Power Company in Michigan is really rising above a big problem. It's hired a one-man helicopter crew to travel along transmission lines using motor-powered saw blades to trim trees that come too close to the wires. It may seem like a lot of work, but the company says it would cost about five times more to use a crew on the ground. 
And even though this tree cut will take all month, the trim could last five years. See? Easy way to do it. Just need a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have friends with that kind of connection. Well, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, <laughs> we're going to recap our top story. Well, the city is looking at cutting its meals on wheels from its services due to saving costs, but the Red Cross says it is interested in picking up the program. In the Border Cats uh, game at Port Arthur Stadium against Eau Claire has been rained out tonight. The two teams will hopefully get into seven inning games tomorrow night. And we'll also update you on the Thunder Bay Selects of the Canadian Senior Little League Baseball Championships later on. And unfortunately, uh, those rain showers we had throughout most of the day expected to continue overnight tonight and into tomorrow. Uh, hopefully clearing up shortly after that. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a good night. Thank you.